another thing, of course, that uh, people who favor sort of far right wing uh, sort of opinions in other countries that look to Japan, not only for its lack of any hate speech or even acknowledgement that hate speech exists in Japan, they also look at Japan's refugee situation. They say, oh, we should be like that. And uh, specifically, the idea that Japan uh, gets, I think the numbers uh, have been going down, of course, last year, hardly anyone could actually travel. So the numbers were a lot less last year. But the refugee recognition rate is 0.4%. And, you know, I think this is something like 20,000 people applied, not very high numbers compared to what most, uh, you know, other OECD, OECD nations get. But the number that actually get recognized, 0.4%. And look, um, I've talked about this at length before. Of course, there are people who are economic refugees or people from poor countries looking for, you know, who wouldn't be entitled to working visas or other types of visas and are looking for a better life for their families. And, you know, um, um, there, there, there are plenty of cases, of course, um, where, where, where people wouldn't meet the objective criteria of the, you know, UN Human Rights Council of being refugees attempting to apply for refugee status, even manipulating the system to get temporary work visas uh, and, and to work and set themselves up and maybe to move on to the next country while they're trying to be, have their appeals being heard and whatever in countries like Japan. So certainly there, there, there I, I'm, I, I don't doubt that there are people who game the system, but I do think that, you know, uh, out of all of, given, given all the wars and the places where most of, you know, where a lot of these applicants come for, from, the idea that only 0.4% of the people applying are legitimate uh, refugees points to something being wrong. And uh, how things are wrong actually came up in the debate over, that's happening right now about uh, the, the immigration law and trying to tighten this up. Uh, one of the vice ministers who actually was like the final people when it actually goes through this incredible arcane sort of process where all the way up, you know, you have to produce evidence, you, which is hard if you're running away from a country to actually have evidence to prove what you're running away from is kind of hard to have as well, all the documentation and whatnot, then to go through all the different levels of the applications and so on and getting approved and passed up. And when, when these are passed up for final approval, you still have people at the top, including, for example, um, at the very top here, vice ministers who say that uh, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find the application convincing, so I refused to give my signature. Um, LDP members just saying that, you know, um, and ironically, even when the staff said after all of this that they wanted to recognize certain cases, they found the fact that the refugee had evidence proving that they were a refugee in itself to be suspicious. <laughs> and so they, 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 at the very top, they still just refused to sign. Um, so this is just it. You just have people, you know, the fact that they have evidence is proof in, in, in itself that they that they um, couldn't be legitimate refugees and all this sort of thing. And, and, and again, ultimately, the, um, the things the things which come up in Japanese debate, it comes up on TV still. We don't know where these people come from. You know, how do we know that they're safe? How do we know that we're not letting in terrorists? The same kind of rhetoric that happens in other countries. Uh, um, first of all, it, I know this gets very easily confused with immigration in general. Um, you know, Japan has like more than 2 million foreign residents. The number of refugees that get approved every year are like 20. Um, so for a start, it's got nothing to do with increasing the number to a re and, and that's out of 20,000 applicants. So this is not going to be a source of normal immigration. And when you have people escaping places like Kurdistan, uh, Turkish Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, or whatever places where people can reasonably, you know, people that are coming from war zones, right? Somalia, um, play, you know, places where people can at least come from places which just from where they came from uh, plausibly have explanations that they would legitimately be refugees. Um, again, Japan. Japan has the option to, um, you know, to withdraw from the, the Global Refugees Treaty. Japan contributes tons of money to the United Nations for refugee programs. Uh, it's actually had people in charge of these programs. Uh, so, you know, Japan signed up for these obligations that it would provide legitimate shelter to refugees that land in Japan. And it's just failing the obligations that it's promised. It's breaking its promise. And, you know, uh, to me, if you have people like this in the Ministry of Justice treating refugee cases like this, um, you know, Japan should not be two-faced about it. If they want to withdraw from the refugee convention, they should do it and then suffer the criticism for it. But now it's even worse in a way that they're signing up for it and they're completely failing their obligations. So, yeah, just an interesting uh, story by the Mainichi just talking about just the sheer impossibility. I mean, you read this case where actually even the cases that got through the whole process to the end were still getting shot down by elected politicians who just didn't believe the story after, you know, after it got all the way through to them.
um, just shows how broken the system here is. And again, this is what the Mainichi is correctly pointing out, that the tightening the, the immigration law isn't really what's needed when what's broken isn't, you know, is actually the, the, the whole underlying uh, infrastructure for it. So, yeah.